I'm particularly delighted to welcome you to this conference, Climate and Community, Le Climat Tous Ensemble. I thank the IAEA for co-organizing this half day long webinar with the French Embassy. And I congratulate the IAEA for its 30th anniversary and for the impressive program organized this month. The French Embassy is glad to have joined this celebration with two important events. France and Ireland share strong links at the joint visit of Foreign Minister Le Drian and Europe Minister Clément Beaune a few days ago illustrates the dynamism of this very warm, strong and friendly relationship. Both ministers have participated in an IA webinar and could present France's vision for the future of European integration. Climate action is at the core of the action of the French government. Like Ireland, France has recently adopted a new climate and resilience law. France has also been at the forefront to bring together all EU member states and the EU to raise commitment in terms of reduction of greenhouse gas emission by 2030. Le Climat Tous Ensemble is a magnificent opportunity to show the commitment of our two countries toward a carbon neutral, more resilient, fairer, and more united society. This conference brings together French, Irish, and African speakers and shows the importance of the role of grassroots engagement. It will be structured around three sessions. The first session will focus on the policy landscape in France, Ireland, and Europe ahead of COP26. It will bring together Mr. Eamon Ryan, Irish Minister in charge of Environment and Climate, Mrs. Laurence Tubiana, President of the European Climate Foundation and key architect of the Paris Agreement, and who today continues to maintain the momentum set in motion by the Paris Agreement. And Stéphane Cruza, France's climate ambassador and my esteemed predecessor here at the French Embassy in Ireland. Thank you all for being here today. The second session will bring together the leaders of Decathlon Island. Decathlon is a world leading retailer for sport and outdoors activities and, and post. Both will discuss the role of the private sector as the sustainable development goals and how companies and businesses are already planning how they engage with the SDGs, integrate them into the strategy and the management of the business. Finally, the third session will bring together climate advocates with three generation of very committed women. Mrs. Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, former United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and currently president of the Elders and the Climate Justice Foundation. Mrs. Ina Moja, Malian artist, ambassador of the Great Green Wall, a project to plant a wall of trees from Senegal to Ethiopia that could save Africa from global warming. And Ms. Orla Murphy, representative of the winning team of the Inter-University Climaton Competition 2021, organized by the French Embassy in Ireland. She will deliver a presentation on sustainable fashion. And I would like to stress that the health crisis has not stopped the students' commitment and proposal and use participation is crucial for the climate challenge. I would also encourage you all to join us at the end of the conference at 12 p 12 15 p.m irish time on the embassy's twitch channel for debate with young irish and french committed to the climate thank you all and enjoy the conference and now stefan the floor is yours thank you very much uh, vincent merci beaucoup uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen it's a real pleasure to be back in dublin albeit virtually and to see that the excellent collaboration between the IIEA and the French Embassy is as strong as ever. So I'm very pleased to welcome you to session one of this conference. Uh, and this session is entitled The Climate Policy Landscape Before COP26. We are now six months away from COP26, the UN's 26th Conference of the Parties, which will take place in Glasgow in November. Why is this COP so important? Well, first, because it will be the fifth COP after COP21, which saw the adoption of the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement says that every five years, parties will have 
to step up their ambition. And so here we are. But it's important above all because we cannot wait any longer. The IPC, IPCC tells us that we must reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 45% between 2010 and 2030, if we want to stay on a trajectory of 1.5 degrees Celsius of temperature in increase. However, the UNFCCC Secretariat has shown us that with the nationally determined contributions transmitted by the end of 2020, we're only at 0.5% of reduction uh, of emission reduction. So for COP26 to be a success, we'll need to achieve several things and that's what France, along with the EU, is advocating. First, we need to have a long-term strategy that leads us toward carbon neutrality. The EU, China, Japan, Korea, even Brazil at the recent climate summit on, 20, on April 22nd have made this commitment. And today, two thirds of emissions are covered by such a target. But a 2050 horizon is not enough. We have to define a credible trajectory to get there. The EU has done so with a goal of 55% uh, reductions of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared to 1990. And that's a huge increase from our previous target of 40%. And then the US, Japan, Canada made very significant announcements at the climate summit on, on, on April 22nd. Today, the G7 countries have all the trajectory that makes the 2050 carbon neutrality goal credible. But the other major entities must do the same, in particular all the G20 countries, which represent 80% of global emissions. And we're working with them to try and convince them to make these commitments. Second, we must collectively rapidly phase out fossil fuels. That's what France is currently doing. Coal in France is a thing of the past. We only have four coal-fired power plants that produce 1% of the electricity in France and all of them will shut down by next year. Support for fossil fuels must end. France will no longer award public guarantees for the exploration and exploitation of new oil fields in 2025 and in 2035 at the latest for gas. And last week, all G7 members committed to end international, international support for coal this year. And third, we must move forward on climate finance. In, remember in 2009, developed countries promised to deliver every year from 2020 onwards, $100 billion for climate finance to help developing countries in their fight against climate change. France is committing 6 billion euros every year, a third of which is allocated for adaptation to the impacts of climate change. And finally, at COP26, Negotiations must be concluded on the so-called rule book for implementing the Paris Agreement. We made a lot of progress uh, at COP24 in Katowice in 2018, but there is some unfinished business. Article 6 in particular on the greenhouse gas emissions trading is a very technical subject, but it's essential to do it right if we want to ensure the environment and environmental integrity of the Paris Agreement. So there is much to be done. Uh, to make twin, COP26 a success, and France is fully committed to do its part. So in this session, we will hear expert insights from two distinguished speakers. Laurence Tubiana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation and key architect of the Paris Agreement at COP21, will deliver an address, followed by Minister Eamon Ryan, TD, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications, and Minister for Transport in the Government of Ireland. Each speaker will speak for approximately 15 minutes. And after these two presentations, we'll go to the Q&A session with you, our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And may I ask that you identify yourself and affiliation when you ask a question. A reminder for the entire conference, including the uh, the Q&A sessions, everything will be on the record today. So please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, uh, hash, uh, hashtag climate community. So allow me to introduce our first keynote speaker of the conference. Laurence Tubiana is CEO of the European Climate Foundation. In addition to her role at ECF, she's the chair of the board of governors at the Agence Française de Développement the French Development Agency, a professor at Sciences Po uh, in Paris, 
Before joining ECF, uh, she was France's climate ambassador and special representative for COP21, and as such, a key architect of the landmark Paris Agreement. Following COP21 and through COP22, she was appointed high-level champion for climate action. Madame Tubiana brings decades of expertise. From 1997 to 2002, she served as senior advisor on the environment to French Prime Minister Lionel Jospin. She founded in, in 2002 and directed until 2014 the Institute of Sustainable Development and Inter International Relation, IDRI, and she has held academic positions at Sciences Po and as Professor of International Affairs at Columbia University. She's been a member of new, numerous boards and scientific committees, including the Chinese Committee on the Environment and International Development. So, Chalorance, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Stéphane, <clears throat> and very happy to be here. And thank you to, for this invitation. Uh, on the really important role that each of us, uh, as uh, your the previous former president of Ireland said, Mary Robinson, that every, every everyone has something to do, even if maybe sometime the the element seems too difficult. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Just I have just a problem. One second, I have. A, uh, an, Sorry, I had a family emergency, but it's okay. So as um, the, the problem of the interlinkages uh, of the crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and the need for a socially just transition to address them, which is the topic you, you asked me to, to present and to reflect upon is absolutely central. And I'm very grateful that now and, and Ireland is giving a, a, a strong signal and the Institute of course, just thinking about that is really to, we cannot think the crisis separately. We have to think them all together in particular <clears throat> in the context of this uh, convention, this COVID crisis and with all these economic and social consequences. As Stefan said very, very clearly, the Paris Agreement is a central pillar of our collective fight against climate change. And the COP26 in Glasgow is very important for all the reasons he mentioned to strengthen that pillar. <clears throat> Not only because of course, uh, we have to revise the contribution that it was uh, noted in COP21, COP COP where the idea was uh, because that when the Paris Agreement will enter into force, uh, totally be implemented, that was 2020, uh, all countries has to revise their intended national contribution and to make them definitive. So that's a crucial moment, as Stefan Cruz has said. Since last year, what we have seen, 83 countries have submitted new targets, including the EU countries, submitting as the EU 27, also, 101 countries, uh, including, of course, some major emitters, have yet to submit their plan, meaning the plan for 2030. And as Stefan said very rightly, even if um, many countries are now agreeing on a net zero goal by 2050, uh, that what was important now really is really not to lose this very, very decisive decade because more ambition is needed for all countries. We are still on track, as he mentioned, for the 2.4 degrees Celsius of global warming. And additionally, if you have making progress on mitigation ambition, which again, we are not there still, we are falling behind on supporting action on adaptation and finance. Uh, the 100 billion year committed in 2009 has not been yet met even if 2021, maybe uh, finally we will find a better result because a number of countries have raised their contribution and the multilateral development banks in particular has up really uh, have upgraded their, their capacity. So still it is a very important and urgent priority for all donors in action, including providing an equal share for adaptation. And because all the language around shifting the private finance and in particular shifting the trillions of necessary investment has to go hand in hand with the public finance. So we should not lose this objective for Glasgow. 
So we have important milestones. The G7 in particular, um, headed by and shared by UK <clears throat> and some intersessional meetings that are starting at the end of this month uh, in the framework of the UNFCCC convention, meaning make, can make significant progress. And I am relatively optimistic around, at least as Stefan Cruza mentioned, a, a very encouraging conclusion of the G7 uh, some days ago. So climate neutrality is a major theme for COP26. Uh, it's uh, really, uh, and it was of course embedded in the uh, Paris Agreement goal. It's interesting to see that the net zero formulation now is, is really getting a lot of attention, a lot of attraction. And uh, the, the mention, you may remember that in the Paris Agreement, the idea of achieving a balance of sinks and sources, uh, which was a way acceptable at that time uh, to uh, mention that we have to go for net zero by mid-century. So it's good, many more countries are pointing to that, but we need action now. So this is very important for Glasgow. Mainstreaming the objective of net zero emission is really important. And as, as much as we can, having carbon neutrality by 2050 or very soon after is a basis for every action. But really more importantly, and I totally recognize the necessity to insist on the 2030 target and really credible plans to go to net zero by 2050. So we, we need to focus attention on the plan of action in the short and medium term, because that will turn the needle in a way, the center of gravity of the global economy. And, but these plans must build on one of the core principles of the Paris Agreement, which is inclusivity. You know, it was not just for government, and we know that governments can do a lot, but cannot do alone uh, to really meet this very, very ambitious goal, which are about transformation of all society and all economies. So that's why some national actors, civil society, and the private sector are to implement Paris. It's a shared responsibility. And I was encouraged along all these five years to see uh, well, states, universities, cities, businesses saying uh, in US, we are still in, you remember when <clears throat> President Trump decided to withdraw from Paris Agreement and with an enormous amount of actors said, we are still in. And, and this, even if countries, of course, got, no government followed the path of US at that time, but the involvement of the local authorities and private sector and the financial community has been really genuinely engaged. But of course, climate is very important, but it is really, and, and really I recognize all the efforts now to link the climate crisis with other global priorities. The, the UN Biodiversity Summit hosted by China in October, the Food System Summit will be key opportunities to link action across the SDGs. It would be really detrimental to really fight one SDG against the other. And it's a very, active discussion, by the way, because we know that with, with the COVID crisis, we need a much more solidarity across nation. And we need, of course, to work on the debt relief in particular. But we should not oppose climate to, let's say, health or biodiversity protecting nature and, and fighting poverty. This is really a, a, a combined. And we, we have the chance. We, have, we are really. Uh, lucky in that we have a, a whole, uh, whole the, across the board conception of what the development should look like, which are the SDGs agenda. So these crises are connected. The biodiversity crisis in particular with the climate crisis is connected, as well as, by the way, uh, the, the, the enormous challenges that agriculture and food system are facing. So we, we have the chance to tackle them together and to ensure a global transition for a sustainable future. And again, this will require this transition to be just and based on social justice, including at the global level. So the COVID crisis has shown that we cannot act out of sync with nature. And the twin impacts of COVID and climate disaster has been devastating to vulnerable countries already who need urgent support for debt restructuring to give them the fiscal space to support people and urgent access to vaccines. Well, multilateralism has to move online and it's not, of course, easy. 
And we must ensure that we do not become siloed in our thinking across platform. I, I feel that very strongly. We are talking the, the Zoom mood now is, is in a way closing everyone in its own bubble. And it's more than urgent now just to cross our discussion. So it's very important that the COP26 presidency has launched a number of, of dialogues, in particular, the food, agriculture, and commodity trade, uh, bringing, back, bringing together forest, agriculture, and trade commodities group together. That's really important. At COP26, for example, when we will discuss Article 6, building hopefully on the San Jose principle, meaning clear guidance on what is really credible and, as Stefan Cruz has said, the environmental integrity. Uh, we need to build nature together with climate in these articles. And in particular, we have to really make important progress that companies do not rely on offsets to replace mitigation action. And it's good to see the emergence of voluntary carbon market integrity initiative to provide guidance and quality. Quality will be, in my view, both from government and from the private sector and from the financial community, a key result for Glasgow. Very quickly, the EU Green Deal and so happy to see Ireland very, very active in this discussion, committing, of course, to climate neutrality by 2050, committing to 55% by 2030. The package will be a very important one in July 14, presented by the Commission after hopefully a very good summit of the head of state to encourage, of course, all institutions and all government to go further. And it really, the EU Green Deal is turning that commitment into real positive change for the people and the planet. And it's not, which is a very big value of the Green Deal in my view, it's not just about carbon emissions. It's uh, important, it's a new food for fork, to fork, to food to fork strategy, re reorienting the European food system, for example, towards healthy diets, rural development. We have seen recently again, the insistence of protecting the small farmers in, in Europe, environmental protection, the new biodiversity strategy to restore European most precious ecosystem. So the Green Deal, in my view, is a resonance of having a, a whole across the board SDG vision for Europe. So it's really the opportunity to make the post-COVID truly resilient by putting climate action, environment protection, and social justice. And speaking in a very pro-European pro country, uh, and really I, I thank you, uh, Ireland, to, to maintain that line in, in, in times who have not been always easy for the project and the value and, the, uh, and in a way the desirability of Europe. It's because, you know, um, it's a turning point it's a manifest, the Green Deal is not coming from the top. It's coming as well from European society that has voted for a greener parliament, uh, not only on the Green Party, but all across the different groups and has asked the European Commission to be trustful to that mandate. And that's why we have the Green Deal. So Ireland leadership on this stage, Europe and the global stage is in my view, very important. Uh, one, because as I said, you are a proud member of the European Union and continue to play this role. And also climate change is often framed as a problem for the world's largest economy. Um, this is uh, a critical role for smaller countries to play. I believe this very, very strongly. Uh, clubs of major countries are important. They will not solve the problem. We need all of us. We need all countries, including smaller countries. This is why we build ambition in Paris, and, and Stéphane was there together with, with me, and we were all fighting for a truly inclusive process. And that's why Ireland has a role to play, to continue arguing for multilateralism to be inclusive and really showing that it's not a, mem it's not a problem for big countries, big players to solve. It's a collective effort. And if not, it will not be uh, with together with climate justice and justice, social justice in general. So it's a very inspiring story you, you can tell. I, I remember, um, I, I think the climate bill you have just passed, it's impressive it, endorsement of all the parties in parliament, one, 170 votes against 12, uh, putting domestic law targets that are broadly in line with the EU goal of net zero by 2050, strong governance, 
that my foundation has been pushing for across Europe, independent expert advisory and oversight council, duty on minister to produce action plan in line with targets, which is so important across the board to have this roadmap for each ministry, mechanism for regular parliamentary accountability. So that's very interesting to see how Ireland has got there. Ireland was self-confessed climate laggard until recently. Uh, remember, PM Leo Varadkar admitted to the European Parliament just three years ago in 2018. But we have watched with interest as Ireland that follows this innovative path to change that role. And the turning point may have been Ireland pioneering, you, pioneering views of the Citizen Assembly. We have copied, by the way, in the French case, which in 2017 considers the question how the state can make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change. So this reveals a stunning consensus in favor of measures that politicians had long thought would be unpalatable to the electorate. It led directly to a parliamentary consensus between the new climate bill. It's a model. I think it's really impressive as a result, again, for Europe and, and globally on the stage. And you see now the interest that citizen assembly are raising all over the world. So citizen assembly as a model of deliberative democracy, maybe one of Ireland's most consequential gifts to the world on climate change so far. Of course, very active civil society engagement. We'll hear from Mary, my dear friend, Mary Robinson, later in the day. And you have been working on climate change for years to the school strikes. The wave of youth activism helped change the conversation on climate action here, of course, as it has around the world. So I can really acknowledge with really being very happy that Ireland is already a world leader. We, you already integrate with energy on the grid as a truly impressive 40% over 2020 as a whole, and sometimes 70% at times. Doubly impressive given that Ireland is a small island. Iran also passed laws banning fracking and divesting its sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuels, a, a trend that we have to encourage everywhere. Very encouraging to see Ireland bogs are being rehabilitated following decades of peat extraction for fuel. So important in this day, we see the role of peat land as very important to maintain uh, carbon sequestration. Of course, real challenge to be addressed in driving down sectoral emission, particularly from agriculture, which make up over a third of your emission. Ireland food and farming sector is justly world famous, yet the transition to a truly Paris compatible food system will be a massive undertaking. And you can, again, give a, a sort of leadership for many countries who are facing the same problem. I'm thinking at that time to New Zealand, for example. Ireland will have to put special effort in figuring how a small, open, export-oriented country can develop a climate-friendly agriculture and food sector. The need for the just transition in the farming sector will, is well understood across Europe. And you play a role in the European design of the CAP very strongly, and you will play a role. So please work with all the actors you can find to really uh, make Ireland a leader in the agricultural transition to match its pioneering example on the energy transition and encourage other country, including mine on the French side in this transition. So we, we, thanks to Paris Agreement, we have a framework to put us on the path where we want to go. But now we must deliver action to back up these goals. Governments must ensure that COP26 collective understanding is there on how we have, so how is so important these days. We have to achieve the goals of Paris Agreement, not targets only, but really the path to get there. And Ireland has a unique opportunity to be part of this leadership push for a Glasgow COP that would make 2021 a super year, a year of transformation. I'm confident that Ireland as a fierce country, a proud member of the European Union can rise to these challenges. It could provide a good news story to inspire other countries facing similar challenge of their own. This beyond the actual tones of greenhouse gas is abated. That could be Ireland's most decisive acts towards the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So thank you again very much for this invitation. And thank you, Stefan, for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, Laurence. Uh, thank you for, your, for this uh, very, very insightful presentation, touching of, uh, on the importance of the EU and the EU Green, Green Deal, touching upon the inclusiveness of uh, 
multilateralism, which is so important for the for the, the UNFCCC process, and also touching upon the importance of uh, Ireland's role. I was myself very struck between the time I arrived in Ireland and the time I left between 2017 and 2020 at how Ireland had changed its, uh, its course and its discourse uh, on the issue of, of climate change. And uh, for that, uh, we would be delighted to have uh, uh, the view of, uh, of the minister in charge of this. Uh, we have uh, already several questions coming in already, but uh, just a reminder to, to you all that you can submit your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will get to them shortly. Uh, so now let me introduce our second keynote speaker for this session. Um, Eamon Ryan, PD, is Minister for Environment, Climate and Communication, and Minister for Transport. He was appointed to this role in June 2020, and he's also leader of the Green Party. He was elected to represent Dublin Bay South in the 2020 general election. He was the founding chairperson of the Dublin Cycling Campaign and began his political career as a Dublin city councillor for the Rathgar Rathmines Ward. He went on to serve both as a TD for Dublin South and as a government minister for communications, energy and natural resources. In recent years, he has worked for a European climate organization and previously chaired the Digital Policy Group at the IIEA. So Minister Ryan, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Stéphane et Laurence. Je suis très content d'avoir l'occasion à parler uh, aujourd'hui à cette conference. Um, I want to first of all start by recognizing French diplomacy and climate action. I go back, as you say, former Minister of Energy, it was Jean-Louis Borloo who brought us together as European energy ministers back in 2009, I think to frame strong European renewables and climate legislation then. I remember being in Paris when the text of the Paris Agreement came out and the excitement, the sense of promise, the sense of, for the first time in a long time in climate action, that we were actually starting to make the necessary moves. And that was French diplomacy at its core. And I think the same today, France has a key role. Um, I hope Ireland can also play its part. Laurence, it's true what you say. There has been progress here. We have gone from being laggards. We're not leaders yet in actual delivery. That has to come, it, it will come. But in the political and public story around climate in our country, I think things have changed and we want to shift towards leadership. And, and we'll have to. Uh, we've set ourselves really ambitious targets to half our emissions in this decade. That catching up gives us a greater commitment, requires us to make a greater change. It's beyond compare challenging, but it will lead to it. It can only work if it's a better economy, if it's a better society, if it's a better country and an environment, not just in climate terms, but also in the restoration of nature. I want to use the 15 minutes or so I have maybe just to speak about three things, about connection, about community and about diplomacy in the end. Um, and to be very real about it, because we need now to, we have to change reality is, is what our job is, to change uh, everything for the better. In that, the energy system and change the energy system will be core. And in that, in my mind, the development of good grids, connected grids, is going to be central to our ability to de deliver this new economy. Um, I'm very pleased that one of the projects we have in changing reality working at the moment is an interconnector between France and Ireland, the Celtic interconnector. It's some 700 megawatts of capability. It, it very well funded and supported by the European Union. Um, but it's critical because to change our energy system, we need to switch in my mind now to zero carbon uh, energy system. Renewables, as the International Energy Agency outlook is saying recently, will make up the vast majority, 90% of this new power system. And it will be critical for it to work to have a balancing. The center of this new revolution, industrial revolution, is balancing variable supply and variable demand. And, and it will not work on isolated grids. It will work best when we have the maximum amount of interconnection. It requires more than anything else, trust, trust between neighbors to share power and to provide security for each other by interconnection. 
And particularly because with the competitive advantage now in wind and solar, that the ability for us as the weather systems move across Northwest Europe particularly, to balance this wind power's resource uh, with hydro from the Alps and from Scandinavia, with solar from the South, and also with nuclear from France, it's part of the balancing capability that we need. Um, that is going to be the most economic system for the development of an electricity supply and potentially other fuels coming out of it, of hydrogen ammonia, which will allow us power this new economy in a way that is truly competitive, effective, and that allows us to electrify transport and electrify heat so that we um, stop using fossil fuels, which is what we need to do quickly. So this, these wires, it's only that size, and it's only the start, we can run so many of these interconnections are going to be key. It's critical that we keep the United Kingdom involved in this project, Amon, Amon Ali, um, because um, we're on the other side of that island. Yes, we have France as our closest European neighbor, but, but we also are very connected to the United Kingdom and will be in energy terms. And also for Northwest Europe to work in this energy system, and we have to think in this regional way now, the United Kingdom is not going to sail off towards the Faroe Islands or in some other direction. The tectonic plates will keep it where it is. And its large load and its large capacity to generate renewables as well in this balancing system is going to be key. But it is a regional system. The North Sea's offshore grid initiative was signed back that, that time, 10 years ago when we were ministers. And it, it, in my mind, is critical now in the European Council that we make not just this connection between France and Ireland, but a whole range of new connections. We have a balancing system in this energy uh, future. As well as providing power connection, those cables can also provide a digital connection. We have to run fiber optic cables uh, alongside the power lines to manage the system, but also to increase our digital connectivity. And this is the second point I suppose I seek to make in this, there are various revolutions taking place in clean energy, in digital revolution and in transport revolution. The digital revolution is also key. And I look forward to that enhanced digital connectivity between Ireland and France, which will come from that cable. I think in the digital revolution, the key change we need to, need to make is around community, is around the ethics or the sense of where does the power lie? Does it lie with the citizen or does it lie with the corporation? How can we get public trust in this transition? Because as well as doing this balancing act at the transmission grid system, we will also need to do it at the distribution system. This is the key of the changes we need to make. If we're to electrify transport and heating, that we need really sophisticated management of our distribution electricity grids to allow us to balance that power and to make it work effectively, to give people heat, to give people light, to give people power for their work and so on. And that, in my mind, requires a sense of justice behind the transition, requires public cooperation, requires the sharing of data, just as we need to share between countries power, we need to share within our community information so we can do this digital and clean energy transition in a way that has mass public support, has to retain, Laurence, as you say, this, this political support for the change, we need public support for it. And that in turn has to involve a sense of uh, involvement, connection, ownership. It has to be a just transition. And it has to be an understanding that this transmission, this change at the distribution level is the grand project to end fuel poverty in our community, among our people, as a way of protecting their health, protecting their incomes and providing for their quality, their everyday quality of life. And that's a second project we can work on together at the European Council. We will not have one set of digital rules for Dublin and a different set of rules for Dijon or for Dusseldorf are indeed for London. I think it will be the same rules because the systems we have to share here need to we need to develop them quickly and disperse them quickly and have public confidence quickly. So we also need to work on those digital connect community ethics rules in my mind to make this happen. Thirdly, and these are big projects we need to do, but they're 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 the business of, of politics at this present time. Thirdly, in diplomacy. 
Lance, you said there's a very true point. How do we in Ireland change our agricultural system, which accounts for 35% of our climate emissions? Um, and we've been an open trading country where the vast majority of food is exported. The key metric here is that we increase the incomes for our farmers while the emissions reduce. We provide a just transition for farming. So a whole generation of new farmers are paid well for looking after our land, uh, restoring nature, as well as storing carbon, improving water quality, reducing pollution, as well as producing high quality food. How do we do it? Central to it, in my mind, is the, well, is payment for those services, but that in turn requires um, us putting a price on these natural services and, and, and putting an, an economic system which starts to recognize it. In the international climate negotiations, I think as well as those trade arrangements you mentioned, Stefan, we also need to start having rules and regulations around methane, um, both fossil methane, but also biogenic methane. And in my mind, if you look at the European policy in methane, which was published last autumn, it starts to recognize that we can't just measure methane as a molecule in terms of, oh, that's the price, it's the same for whatever it is. We do need to make sure in how we price this, that we achieve our biodiversity targets and our social targets, as well as our climate targets. So we want a regulation of biogenic methane, which supports family farming, which supports those young people we need to go into looking after our land, which supports pastoral, less intense farming, which is not dependent on feedstock coming from one side of the world to the other, and then the food going back to the other side of the world in an unsustainable system, which delivers unsustainable development goals, not just the climate goals. And, and that needs to be done at the UN and international level. And in truth, we've been working on this with colleagues, we're only at the start, we're not even starting. We have to. We have a lot of work to do in international climate diplomacy on how we regulate methane, both the protocols on fossil methane and biogenic methane. Um, and I mentioned that because, Lawrence, what you said about food systems is absolutely true. This is event is organized by Tom Ar by the IAEA. Tom Arnold has done some good, very good look, good work with the IAEA. Tom will be going to that UN summit in September on the food summit in conjunction with the UN General Assembly with this food system approach we have to promote. And, and it has to be a food system which is good for biodiversity, which is good for climate, which is good for social resilience. And, and I think then Ireland's role in this, in the diplomacy side, we have just this year, next year, a seat on the UN Security Council, as it happens. We were elected, Laurence, by those small island nations and those developing emerging countries. We stand for the small countries in that, in that seat. We, we sit down for the small countries in that seat. Um, the, I think what we need, and it won't be just delivered in Glasgow. We have to think about the COP, the African COP, which comes after it, but we need to start preparing for that now. We need to start getting agreement, perhaps through the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which was set up to, to look at these short-lived greenhouse gases, among other things, to start saying, let us develop a protocol for biogenic methane, which supports pastoral farming in Africa, which supports climate resilience and adaptation, as well as mitigation, which turns the financing systems in the World Bank and the IMF and all the other systems to support that uh, agricultural approach. And, and yes, absolutely, Stefan, what you say about the French contribution in, in that six billion investment, but we need to do so much more. The whole economic system has to support that type of agriculture, which is good on climate adaptation, which gives social resilience, as well as mitigation. And the reason for that is because it gives us all security. It actually is one of the ways addressing the migrant crisis Europe and Africa faces at this present time, because a lot of the migration is caused by the, the unsustainable, un insecure, not resilient uh, agricultural environment that a lot of farming finds itself within. And it applies for Africa, but it also applies to Ireland and France. France and Ireland have a lot of similar conditions in agriculture, in, in this pastoral system. And yes, maybe it, 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 um, it is favoring that over an intensive industrialized feedlot type system. But I think that it's appropriate. I think we can justify that. And it's not just out of self-interest I'm arguing for this. I think it is the food system approach you mentioned, Laurence, is that it backs it up. In truth, 
the diplomacy has only started in this. I was very encouraged that a uh, former commissioner I used to work with, Andrew Peebogs, is now setting up or heading a, a climb, um, methane observatory, which the, U, uh, the EU and the uh, UN Environmental Programme has been, has been established. But if you talk to people in this diplomatic area, really, we are, we are only at the beginning. And really, we need to step up our, our diplomatic. And because if we do so, we go to Glasgow and we can, those developing emerging countries, those small island nations, which would benefit from this approach to food systems approach and, and climate adaptation and resilience approach to how we manage agriculture, would know that we're not just going with the small crumbs or the kind of here pay you off. This is a fundamental change, which is as important as the energy or transport or other changes that we need to make. So there, I'm sorry for um, um, I don't know, speaking too long, but um, they were the three things I want to, we want to work with. My colleague, Simon Covey is, is uh, working very closely, uh, obviously on the Security Council with myself on this. I will be working on the European Council. There is a very strong uh, community now in the European Council in favor of strong climate action. We have this, uh, we have this group of ministers, uh, and not just green ministers, it's from across the political spectrum at the Council who are really pushing for these type of grid interconnections, better digital, uh, just transition type uh, rules. And, and we need to develop that coalition in my mind around climate diplomacy, around agriculture, which supports climate resilient adaptation. So, so that's what I look forward to in the lead up to Glasgow and beyond, because in truth, uh, it will require more than just Glasgow, but, but Glasgow at least is on the path that Paris set, and that's the right path. It's a legal structure which gives us uh, the, the, the right ability to frame, a bit like our own climate legislation, it doesn't change anything in itself, but it sets up the, the legal structure for us to deliver the scale of change we need. And for that, Laurence, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister uh, Ryan, for, for these uh, very insightful comments. Uh, well, point well taken on methane. Uh, it's, uh, it's a gas that uh, really is a low hanging fruit. It has the potency about 28 times the potency of, uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, indeed, the EU is working on it with its strategy. And, and France is very, very aware of this. And sustainable agriculture as well. It's linked to methane in many, in many, in, in many ways. And we have uh, these, uh, these very uh, uh, common uh, uh, challenges to, to face between our two countries. Now, I have a, uh, some questions coming in. And I'm aware Minister Ryan has to leave rather early, so, so I'll put the Sorry, I've got, I have a Belarusian problem at the moment. We have to go, and there's an international transport forum. I have to speak at it later, but, but I'm here for the next 20 minutes, um, Stefan, so that's okay. Oh, oh, good, good, good. So, so, you, so we, you'll be able to stay till the end of the, of the session. That's uh, yeah. wonderful. But I'll put the first question to you then. Um, it's a question from Rachel Toll, the Climate Ambassador for Sligo, uh, talking about ocean. And she says, ocean life is essential against climate change as a humpback whale in their lifespan can consume 33 tons of carbon dioxide compared to one tree in 100 years that consumes only 2.4 tons. The question is, will the EU bring in more, uh, br uh, br bring in more no fishing zones to help the ocean life thrive? Minister Ryan. Uh, yes. Um, we have we have this European um, approach now, and it's having to have thirty percent marine protected areas by twenty thirty, um, and and I think our ocean is ten times our land area in size. It's the most one of the most interesting areas in the planet because it's an area that's changing probably as fast as anywhere because as the ice melts in Greenland and comes down. We have this blob of cold air, cold water and air just in, to the northwest of Ireland. Um, and, and we need to study it. The, the Commander Mark, uh, Admiral Mark Mallet, at the head of the Irish Armed Forces, is really good on this issue. Uh, he has a, um, his degree, his PhD is in climate emergency crisis management, as it happens. And he makes the point that we really need to understand what's happening. We need. We don't have enough scientific knowledge of the ecology of the Northwest Atlantic, and I think Ireland has a role. We have a a role to 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 
to really invest in the research, the scientific research, so that it can be part of the solution because the oceans have been storing all the carbon we've been emitting. And, and if that is threatened, which it seems according to the latest science, then this is the most critical issue. So we will, we need to invest in and that, those marine protected areas give us a chance to, to do it. I would also say though, that Northwest, particularly Sligo, Donegal up the Northwest is also probably the windiest place. And in this balancing system that we talk about, if in the middle of winter you have a very cold high pressure zone, you may well, wind power will not be very strong across Europe, but it will still be strong in the northwest of Ireland, and particularly with floating offshore wind, which is the technology we expect to evolve at scale, large scale. Um, that northwest area will still actually provide a lot of power and provide this balancing capability we need. We need to design our offshore energy systems, which is going to be central to the Irish economy and the development of the Irish economy into the future. We need to design it in a way that is, is sustainable with the environmental protection and restoration of marine life in the Northwest Atlantic. And I think we can do that. Thank you very much. Now I have a question for both of you. Uh, it comes from David Runciman of Cambridge who notes that climate and environmental politics are, um, are emerging as a new fracture line in democratic systems between the old and young, between those who want or need to drive and those who are able to cycle or take public transport, particularly relevant in France with the Gilets Jaunes movement back in 2018. So the question is, are democratic polities at a structural disadvantage to implement the radical solutions needed to avert climate disaster if voters, politicians, and political systems all reward short-termism and dissuade long-term investment. Maybe Laurence, you want to, to kick off? And you need to unmute yourself, Laurence. So um, very, well, happy to start. I'm sure that will be very interesting that Minister Iman comes back because that was really a question that Ireland has, has touched upon directly. Um, I think it's, it's always a complex issue. Uh, climate change can be portrayed as an elite issue against people. Uh, some parties, of course, in particular far right parties across Europe as, as trying to do that, we haven't seen some, some time as well at global level authoritarian regime pleading that climate change is for, for well of people against, uh, against uh, the poorest people. So it's a, it's a really very, very serious question. And we see, for example, the movement against wind farms and, um, and wind turbines in the eastern part of Germany as a, uh, you know, and we will see that in France very soon, unfortunately. So, so wind turbine is considered as something against people by the extreme rights. So I think, uh, but when you look at authoritarian regimes, that's not the response either, because again, there are vested interests there as well, powerful one, and you see, uh, so I don't think it's democracy against uh, authoritarian regime to solve the environment is about how you include people and citizen and, and in a way in the shaping of public policies. At least that's what I believe very strongly in. And that's why at one time, at one side, you need much more information reaching to the public. So the, the experience I had through the citizen convention is that people don't get the information they need. When they get the information they need, they shape their consciousness, their decision-making, their preference differently on when they don't have that information. And you know, finally, when you look at the media coverage of climate change, it's there, but it's very, very shallow. So people, that was exactly what the citizen told us when we had the first session with the 150 citizens that have been chosen again uh, randomly. And they say, you know, if we had, if we knew that, it's, it's a shock, meaning the information when it is well done and well and profound and deep enough for, for the people, it's a shock. And that makes them seeing the question differently. And that was a collective intelligence that citizen assembly or other processes can, can develop is in my view, the more solid background for politicians to operate. They need, governments need support. You can't, you can't operate against your country or, or when you, against your public. But if you don't do that, you assume that 
the vested interests, the one who are in the street. And you know, the Gilets jaunes have very different views. You have now um, uh, yellow vest people organized in environment NGO nowadays. So it was not black and, and white. It was the social justice element was the first one. Uh, we, 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 we are not against the carbon tax, we are against the carbon tax if it, uh, if it has a regressive impact on ourselves because we cannot make another choice for transport, for example. So that's why social justice is. So consultation, involvement of citizen, given uh, allowing citizens to have agency in the transformation we have to face is a key element. The second one, of course, together, and it's not the one or the other, the social justice element. The environment policy have been many times regressive in the past because too much focused on, on in a way, accessibility and prices. And we need a much more public engagement infrastructure allowing um, poorest household to benefit from the environment policy and not be paying the price of it. So that is my response to it. Thank you very much, Laurence. Uh, just to clarify, the question came from Alex Conway, who's a researcher at IIEA, who is quoting David Rumsman. Minister Ryan, uh, your reaction on that question, and I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up after that, uh, that uh, final intervention. Okay. Um, I, might, I might take a few minutes to answer it then, if I can, because it's, it's a very a big question, a good question. Um, I do think Ireland is, is, is interesting what we've done politically has been significant in, in, um, in getting a broader consensus for action. Now, it's, <laughs> turn that into decisions that actually, where you reallocate space for public transport and so on, or it's gonna be different, but we have. I think often good things come out of failures in a way. If, you know, we made, um, we had a real loss of confidence in our democratic system after the financial crash. We were flying and then we, we the Irish public, it was a very hard hit to our confidence and our in our political system as well as anything, and and out of that some innovative thinking came in politically in Ireland around our constitutional democratic republic and which we're very proud of, and but it included innovations like the citizens assembly model which did have an effect on us and not just in climate but in other social issues that have been difficult for us to address in many for many years. I think you have to be very careful that it's not just a quick fix solution, just, oh, you just do a citizen assembly, then you're fine. What we learned is, is that you have to then trans, you have to then bring that into the parliament, which we did with, with really involving the parliament on a cross-party basis. We had a joint access committee, which was very, um, did good work. And in fairness to then the, the, the minister backed that up and worked in a collaborative way. And, and it's, it's that step by step, it takes five years, maybe to some of the political build consensus has grown. But also secondly, I think for after the failure, the environmental movement, we got it wrong for 30 years. You know, we, our messaging, particularly on climate, and, and particularly maybe always constantly putting the emphasis on the individual, you know, are you doing the right thing? And it, and I, I, my own, that's my own personal views, I, I, I um, about eight or nine, ten years ago, a group of us came together. I was involved in one thing called climategatherings.org, and, and we were looking at what is the story we tell? How do we tell the story? Because we were clearly getting the story of climate change wrong in terms of, you know, people were, were, were switched off from what we were saying, or they felt shamed, or it wasn't working. And, and there was various, we did some work uh, involving a lot of creative um, people, involving the Burn College of Art and, and other places to, to think about this. And we came back some very simple thoughts that I keep sharing because they're, they're still ring home true to me today. How do we do this? Well, we start by asking people for help rather than telling them what to do. We start by listening. We start by admitting uncertainty. We don't know all the technology. It will change, it will evolve, and, and we learn by doing. And this is the most hard one. We often also have to hasten slowly, festina lenta. And that's a really difficult one because there's such an urgency for change. But if you just panic, you kind of come across like that, you, you make mistakes for one, but also people can sense it. And so you have to some ways step back and, and think, what is the, how do we approach this? And, and, and step back to listen is, is one of the, um, but also I suppose we, we really came to the understanding that we need to move away from technocratic language and also our econo econometric language to emotional language around this and, it's, and frame it in a way which, which speaks to the core of all human uh, condition, which is a care for the home, a care for the, the, uh, the heart, the, the center of and community and, and connection. 
and 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 um, to inspire. I remember there, it's and with this happening all over the world in recent years. Just be prior to the Paris Climate Agreement, there was a campaign. People would remember it here in Dublin. We we did something in Stevens Green, and it was, and the words we used on the slogans of the day was for the love of why would you take action on climate and it was willing to speak of love and climate and 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 start framing it in some of that language actually is important and and, and included in that is you don't divide you you avoid the the uh the other and, and the kind of young versus old urban versus rural uh, rich or left right or even it won't work it has to be involve everyone it has to be everywhere and also even just changing the, the psychology in people's heads that why should I do it when the Chinese aren't doing it? Well, actually, you have the opportunity to do it. You have the, you're the center, you're the, you're the key person, your village is the key place, your field is nature being restored in all its glory. And that's as important as the jungle in Brazil. That's every place matters. And I finish on this, at that event, there was, um, the brilliant Irish fiddle player Martin Hayes. I don't know if people know Martin. He's great, uh, um, and his his wife was there. She's a Spanish lady, and she she had to put this where we were thinking about this for several days. And at the very end, she just blew me away with some of her comments. Said, "I know nothing about climate. All I, I but I know I, I her love of her children, her home, her heart, and and the desire to protect that." And it's just spoke to an emotional thing within all of us, which belongs to everyone. It's not exclusive. It's not. And that's what we do have to appeal to. And, and, and for all the grid talk, or all the diplomacy talk, it's the heart and speaking to the heart of the home and protection of the home is where I came around to in terms of how we avoid whatever vest you're wearing. That's something that belongs to everyone. It's, and it's, it's that scale of, of protection we have to appeal to in people's, people's emotional side. Well, thank you very much. Thank you both for these very insightful comments, uh, which just shows that there's so many challenges, but also so, so many solutions that can be found so long, so long as we remain determined to make things happen and, uh, and remain, uh, uh, remain really committed to, to, to those needed changes. So thank you again. That was uh, really, really uh, very insightful. And, um, to let uh, our audience know that the second session of the conference will commence right now after the session and it will address the role that the business community can play in achieving sustainability and decarbonization, decarbonization targets and if you have not yet reg registered for the session you can follow the zoom link which i believe you will now see in the discussion box on your screen so thank you all. Thank you very much for IEA and the French Embassy for convening this, uh, the, the, this uh, overall event and this session in particular. Merci beaucoup, Laurence. Merci beaucoup, Minister Ryan. And keep the good work and, uh, and we'll stay in close touch.